get started today. So we are uh, all right. So we are going to continue on ahead with the next uh, area of insecurity that we're going to look at, and specifically, we're going to look at web and web applications. So a lot. So kind of part of what I want you to be thinking about when we start talking about this is how are how are web applications different from traditional binary applications that we've been looking at? What makes them unique? What makes them different? Uh, why are they interesting? Uh, a, I have my own reasons, but I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Uh, and so basically the plan is we're first going to look at kind of the evolution of the web. We're going to look at some core technologies. We're going to understand how web applications work. And then we're going to look at vulnerabilities vulnerability classes in those web applications. And we'll also try to draw some parallels between the web application vulnerabilities we look at and the binary vulnerabilities that we also saw. And we'll also see that some of the things that can happen in here actually also affect the network security problems that we talked about, right? So, okay, so, the web. This is, believe it or not, an image of the very first web browser. So this in the center, this is a picture of, so it says, welcome to the universe of hypertext, right? Very uh, um, grandiose name. So this was in 1990, 1991. So Tim Berners-Lee, the author of the first World Wide Web browser and server, he worked at CERN. So what does CERN do? Large it does. Large yeah, the LHC, right? They're the thing that's going to destroy the world and create a super black hole where the Earth is and we're all going to be <coughs> blinked out into existence. Um, so he was working there. He had a tech background. And he realized, man, it's really annoying to have to, uh, because they had scientists coming and going to work on the project, now work on the project. And he's like, man, it would be really nice to like have some central directory for who people are, what their phone numbers are, how to get in contact with people so that we could connect with them. So this is the very first website. So this was the very first website on the World Wide Web. It's a wide area hypermedia, inform hypermedia information retrieval initiative aiming to give universal access to a large universe of documents. It's pretty cool. We should all try to write like Tim. Um, and so this is Tim. So Tim Sir, he's, is a sir now from, I assume, the Queen of England. That's how those things go. I don't know. I'm not British. Um, and so he was working at CERN. He proposed this idea of, so at the time, this hypermedia, which we'll talk about what exactly that is, these ideas had already been kind of bubbling up. At the time, there were previous hypertext systems. Um, and so in 1989, he, his proposal was accepted. The people at CERN were like, yes, we think this is a good investment of your time and resources. <coughs> Work on that. Uh, he created the first website at the end of 1990. And I'll say he wrote a book called Weaving the Web. So this is, if you're interested in the web and the origins of the web, I highly recommend this book. It's a really good take on his experience, what things he had to do, and why he thinks it kind of took off. Um, so what's the difference between the internet and the web? What is the internet? Let's start there. Okay. Uh, this is the coordinate for connections or network of computers. Yeah, so interconnect it's a network of networks, right? It is the network of networks where you have independently owned networks and we're all connected to each other. So using the internet or using the internet technologies that we saw, right? TCP, IP, UDP. Right? We can send a packet of information from one computer to any other computer on the internet. So how does that differ from the web? Is the web the internet? Yeah, 
So at uh, what layer, so we talked about kind of the seven layers, so what layer is the email? Application. At the application layer, right? So it's an application level protocol. It uses usually port 25 to do SMTP messages to send hosts. There's a whole protocol designed to do that, right? So then what's the web? It's also just another application, right? It's just another application that uses the internet to do things, right? It uses port 80 typically to do uh, HTTP requests. It uses port 443 to do HTTPS requests, which we won't really get into here. Um, so I do want you, one of the things I want you to keep in your mind, right, especially when you read like popular news articles, right, is oftentimes people conflate these terms, right? They just talk about the web when really they're talking about the internet, or they talk about the internet when they're talking about the web. Um, and so that, that comes up a lot, and it, it makes sense in popular, you know, popular culture because people use the web, right? I mean, they don't really think that they're using all these other protocols and all these layers, right? They don't care. They're just using their web browser. They're firing up a web browser and going to places. Okay. But how do we put the web in the web? So the design originally was envisioned, it was a way to share research results and information at CERN. Um, which kind of, when you think about it, it's kind of crazy that it became this worldwide phenomenon that all, every single one of our phones, computers, everything is using, right? Um, and at the time, uh, Sir Berners Lee, I wonder, if he, I wonder if he likes to be called, I don't know, but uh, he combined kind of some multiple different emerging technologies of hypertext, uh, the internet, TCPIP. And so the hypertext, right, is text, it's essentially the links that you think about on a web page, right? Or just like when you read a research paper, Right? There's references in those research paper. Those references tell you where to find more information or where that idea came from. Right? So you can think of that as a link to some other piece of information. Right? So this idea of hypertext was around, and he kind of combined this with, wow, the internet's actually pretty big. I, can, uh, I actually don't exactly know what you would do on the internet, probably like around 89, like Usenet and email and other things. And so this idea grew into the universal access to a large universe of documents. He said, hey, wouldn't it be great if anybody could put a document out there, and at any place in that document, we could have a link to another document that could live on that machine or on a different machine. And that machine itself, that document, could have other links that we could click on and follow. And that document would have other links, right? So you have this interconnected web of information, have all these documents in this universe and easily accessible to everyone. So, there's three central questions that the architecture of the web, this really drives everything, even the freaking crazy Gmail, Google Maps, all these fancy web applications now. All these three design questions influence the whole design of this technology. How do we name a resource, right? So we were just talking about documents. How do I name a document? Right? And how do I name a document such that my, I don't know, cv.pdf is different from your cv.pdf, right? We just can't have the same name. Once I have a name, how do I then request that resource? And then how does that other machine know how to serve me that resource and give me that resource? And finally, how do we create hypertext? So how do we actually represent these links to other documents? Right? So these are the three key technologies of the web that answer these three questions. Right? So how do we name resources on the web? URLs. URLs? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so technically, I'm just, I'll be completely honest, I don't know that I remember the ultra-fine distinction between URIs and URLs. I believe that URIs are more general and they can be applied to different types of protocols and different types of resources, whereas URLs are more specific to H like HTTP URLs. Um, and then, so we've already actually kind of done a little bit of a homework assignment on this. So how do we request and reserve, res uh, serve a resource? What? What's the protocol? HTTP. 
HTTP, right? Hypertext Transport Protocol. Right? And we can see how these are all related, right? Because really, can you use HTTP to fetch something that is not hypertext? Yeah, I can download PDF documents. PDF document doesn't necessarily have hypertext, right? Or plain text file or an image, a PNG file. Right, so at this point, it's kind of a misnomer, but you can see the historical context. We need some way to name things, which is URIs, URLs. We need some way to fetch those things. And then we need some way to represent that hypertext document. So that's where HTML comes in. And so these actually form these three beautiful connections. So with a URI, right, when you have a URI or a URL, right, that tells you all the information you need in order to make an HTTP request. Right? So you can look at any URI URL and you'll know exactly what HTTP request this is going to make if you want to fetch that resource. So the URI describes the resource and how to get it. HTTP describes how to actually make that request. And then when you make that request, you get back an HTML document. And what do the links on that HTML document have? More URIs, URLs, right? And those could be on that same server, they could be on other servers, right? So it's this cycle, right? This is, you think of when you're browsing the web, this is exactly what you're doing, right? You're starting on one page, learning on one link, you click that page, you get a whole new page with new links. You click one of those links, you get a whole new page with new links, right? And your browser is continually doing this cycle. So this is how these three technologies are all related to each other. So URLs can create HTTP requests, HTTP requests typically result in HTML content. The HTML content gives you more URLs. Okay, so now we're gonna look at each of these in turn. So the URI is, as we said, right, it's essential metadata to describe how to reach and find a resource. So it tries to answer the following questions. Which server has this resource that I want? Right. Who has it? How do I ask for it? And then how can the server locate that resource? Right. So this needs to have enough information so that I know, okay, if I want to fetch um, some HTML page on your server, I need to know how to talk to your server, I need to know what protocol to talk to your server, and then I need to know that there has to be enough information for the server to locate what I'm talking about. So RFC 3986, has the latest, as of January 2005, definition of what exactly the URI is. And we'll see that it's incredibly general. So this should be very familiar with what, your, what you've been looking at with URLs. Right, so the syntax here is we have a scheme, we have a colon, we have an authority, we have a slash, we have a path, followed by a question mark, followed by the qu a query, and then a hash followed by a fragment. So does this look mm, kind of familiar? Yes. Yes? Does it describe all the URLs you've seen? No. No? Why no? There are, like, there are ones without question marks. Mm, yes. Yeah, so there's stuff without question marks, right? There's stuff that have no query, no fragment, right? So yeah, so some of these fields could be optional, right? And so, so okay, so the scheme, right, so this is what makes URI general. So what's the scheme in normal HTTP URLs that you're used to? Oh. seen other URIs that use a similar or that use a different scheme that aren't HTTP? FTP, right? You could send somebody an FTP URI. Right, what else? HTTPS, HTTPS right? It could be HTTPS. Anything else? What was that? LDAP. LDAP, yeah, I think there's an LDAP uh, is definitely a scheme. Any other weird ones? Rsync? Rsync? Yeah, I think Rsync uses this Gopher. Nice. Uh, I haven't. I can't say that I have. It was basically the was it a prefer 
was our competitor to the web, kind of. I don't know if it came first. I think it maybe so did a little bit. Precursor because it was all text based, so you could use it on like mainframes and stuff. Too. Mm, okay. And, and it was like select one to go here, select two to go here, and that's how you browse the web was by using your keypad. Interesting. But actually, I wasn't going to talk about it, but since we brought it up, there is. Um, so if you have a web application that will fetch URLs that you give it, right? So like bit.ly or whatever, right, will go out and maybe fetch that URL, or like Facebook will go fetch a URL to make sure there's no viruses or whatever. Um, if the code's not written correctly and you can change this scheme to be a gopher scheme, you can actually uh, control a lot of what that server will send. So you can actually use these schemes by these weird schemes to get the machine to scan other parts of the network, like its internal network, and give you the results. Yeah, so that's actually, that's the only reason why I know about Gopher, I mean, besides from a historical context. Okay, the authority, right? So the authority is the entity that controls how to interpret the rest of this, right? So basically this is where, it's usually the server name. So this is the server that this resource lives at, right? So it could be google.com, http colon slash slash google.com. It could be, um, and the syntax here, you can do a username at host colon port. So this is why you can do google.com colon uh, whatever, different port to try to get a different port number. This is how you can try to access different ports than the default HTTP 80. But the important thing here is that what this path query and fragment means, to you, the user, you don't care, right? You just know that this defines some resource. And it's up to this authority, this server, to understand, based on this URI, what resource you were talking about. So then the path is usually a path name separated by slashes, right? Just like the Unix system, right? The query is used to pass data. So non-hierarchical means not like the path, right? So this is usually key value pairs in HTTPS, but it doesn't have to be. And what is this fragment? So have you seen fragment stuff? What is it for? What have you seen? What contexts have you seen it in? Uh, IP packets get fragments, yes. Completely different though. This is in URIs. Yeah, we had a hand back. Yeah, so it actually has nothing to do with the server at all. Right? So this is used to identify a subsection or a sub resource of this resource. Right? So you ask for the server for everything up to the fragment. And then when your client gets that back, it decides where to go or what part of that document you meant by the fragment. So this is when I send you a link with a fragment in it, your browser will usually take you directly to that element that has that specific ID. So that's the HTTP standard. OK, so some examples. So we can have something like foo colon slash slash example dot com colon 8042 slash over slash there uh, question mark testy blue bar. Uh, and hash knows, right? So which would be the scheme, authority, path, query, fragment of this? What's the scheme? Foo, the authority? Example.com, yeah. Uh, colon AD42, right? The port is part of that, exactly. So the path would be over there, and the query would be test equals bar, and then the fragment would be knows. So we have an FTP, so this is an FTP URI, right? Same thing. Um, also, you've seen mail to links, right? So this is a scheme mail to, and the authority is hostname at asu.edu, right? And I can have an HTTPS, colon slash slash example.com, right? So can I, is this a valid URI? No, why? The colon one dot HTML. So what's the problem here? Yeah. So is the problem is how to parse this, right? Does this mean that I'm talking about is this whole thing the authority up to this slash, right? Is this the host example.com slash test slash example colon one is then the port, and then slash Adam is the path. 
And then even if we did that, right, where does the path end and the query begin here? Yeah, does it begin at the question mark? So everything after the question mark is a query, but I have a slash here, so maybe that's part of the path. Maybe my path is slash test slash example colon one dot html question mark slash Adam. Maybe this whole thing is the path. Right? Everybody see that there's multiple ways to interpret this? So we have a problem. So this leads us to the reserved characters. So these are the whole set of characters that you can't have in a URI. And so, what do we do? We just never use these in our URIs? What was that? You want to encode them. Yeah. So we need to encode them somehow, right? We need to have some way to tell the server, hey, I meant a colon character in the path, not colon as a port, right? Or I meant slash as part of a query parameter, not slash as part of the path, right? So that's where we get to URIs. Uh, one of the big issues here is percent encoding. Um, so anything that's not alphanumeric, a digit, a dash dot, underscore, or tilde, you have to present percent encode. And percent encoding is very simple. I mean, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. So you have a percent sign followed by the hexadecimal rep representation of that byte. So slash, some of you have seen from the binaries, right? The hex ASCII value is 2F. And I only know that because I also spend time looking at shellcode and that kind of stuff, right? So the URI encoding of a slash would be percent %2F. Cool, so this means ampersand gets transformed into percent %26. The percent sign, how do we encode that? The ASCII value of the percent sign? What was it? Uh, yeah, it would be percent %25, right? So that's how we represent an actual percent, because why is the percent character special? Yeah, because it's used to start the URI, URI encoding, right? So we have to actually encode that. A space gets encoded as percent twenty, and so on and so forth. So now we can fix this example, right? We can say example.com slash test slash example colon one dot html, and then dollar uh, question mark percent two f atom. Right? So now I know that this URI is going to be parsed correctly, and I know exactly how to parse the path, the query, and everything from this URI. Cool. Does that make sense? Sweet. OK. So URIs, so we've probably seen, right? We've seen URLs, or we've seen some on a page. right? So they can either be absolute, where they say, hey, this is exactly the resource I'm talking about. Use HTTPS, talk to example.com, fetch, and pass this path parameter. Or it can specify a location relative to the current resource. So it can say slash slash example.com slash example slash demo.html. So this is going to be relative to the current network path. So whatever the current scheme is, that's what that slash slash means. So whatever, whenever you see this URI, this link, it knows reuse the current scheme. So if it's HTTP, it'll be HTTP colon slash slash example.com. If it's HTTPS, it'll be HTTPS example.com. Uh, same thing for like slash text slash HTML.help. This will be relative to the current authority. So reuse the authority, right? Dot dot slash dot dot slash people.html. So what's this gonna be relative to? Yeah, so relative to the current authority and path, right? So this is going to move us up, right? So what, what did we learn about dot, dot, slash? Yeah, it can change the directory and have security problems. Keep that in mind. Right? So this is part of these things. Whenever you see things like this that remind you of vulnerabilities we talked about, it's probably also a problem here. Uh, in this case, context is important. So it depends on what context we actually are in. So what page are we on when we see one of these relative URLs? 
But the important thing is your browser or whatever user agent you're using has to be able to take these relative URIs and turn them into something absolute. Right? Because it needs to know where to go to fetch that new resource. Right? Okay. Questions on URIs? Sweet. This is hopefully stuff you've already seen before. Um, since you using use the web a lot. Cool, okay, so HTTP is that the layer that talks about how a web client can try to request a resource from a web server. Um, and it's based on TCP. <coughs> Does it have to be? I guess not, but it is. Um, the, the default is TCP port 80. Um, version 1.0 is defined by an RFC in 1996. Version 1.1 .1 got updated in 1999. And version 2.0, right? So have people heard of HTTP 2.0? So I believe it's based on SPDY, which was a protocol developed by Google to do uh, a whole lot of additional improvements to HTTP. Uh, but it's, I believe it's still under discussion. It hasn't actually been finalized, the HTTP 2.0 spec. Does anybody know? Has it, is that incorrect information? Cool. Can be refuted by anybody with a phone. Okay, so in HTTP, right, we have clients and we have servers. So the server, right, as we saw, we've written a little HTTP web server, right? So the server listens for incoming TCP connections on whatever port. The client opens a TCP connection to the server and then sends the request to the server through that TCP connection. Finally, the server reads that request figures out what resource the client wants, and then sends a response containing that resource. Right, so, let's see. Um, so actually, thinking about all the things we've talked about till now, you kind of should have a very good understanding of every single one of these steps, right? So from op listening to TCP connections, from this opening a TCP connection, do you know exactly what packets the client's gonna send? Do you even have an understanding of how those packets make it from one host to the other, traversing the local network, and then how the hops go in IP, right? Um, so this is powerful stuff, so you're learning exactly how everything works. Okay, so we have a client who's running some web browser, and we have some server, right? So the server makes an HTTP request, gets an HTTP response. Um, that's how we can think about things abstractly, right? So we just think about, okay, there's one client, one server, make a request, get a response. That's the bare bones HTTP. Uh, in reality, things are often more complicated, right? So uh, the, there may be a firewall in between the client and the server, so ASU actually has um, not just a firewall, but a, a whole intrusion prevention system that looks for traffic, will drop traffic, if it doesn't like it. Um, you could be talking to not an actual server, but a proxy that actually will forward that connection back to the server. So this could be for load balancing purposes. It could be because the server lives somewhere else that you have no idea where it lives. Um, that proxy could have a cache, right? So it can store and save the data from the server so that, that way it's reducing bandwidth and load on the server. The client also has a cache. So sometimes when you request things, it doesn't actually fetch. So this is why if you've ever had to, somebody tells you to hard refresh, like control R a page, it forces your browser to not use the cache and to request the resources. So what happens is your client usually goes to a firewall, which goes to a proxy, which goes to a server, and then generates that request, finally gets sent back from the server to the proxy to the firewall back to you. There's a lot of moving parts. So this is part of the reason why HD, uh, why web applications are interesting is they are very complicated. There's a lot of moving parts in here. So you can actually have problems at kind of any place along here. Uh, so for a request, right, we've seen a request consists of a method. So this is where we get into the get and the post. Uh, the resource, which is derived from the URI. So what resource are they trying to request? The protocol version. So why is the protocol version important? Compatibility in what sense? Like if we can make more supporters. Yeah, so that way we know what protocol we're talking, right? So I'm trying to talk to you in HTTP 2.0, but the server only supports 2, uh, 1.0. 
right? And we should detect that by seeing what protocol version we're using, right? That way I can tell you, hey, actually, I don't support HTTP 1.1. I only support HTTP 1.0. Uh, we also have information about the client. So this isn't strictly necessary, but this happens very frequently, right? So this is the user agent header that our client sends to tell the server, hey, this is kind of who I am. This is the software that's accessing you. Um, and often, and occasionally a body. So on post requests, we'll see that the uh, post request gets encoded into the body that the client has sent. Okay, so the syntax for a request, we have the start line followed by headers, so any number of headers, followed by a new line, followed by the body. So each line is separated by CRLF, hopefully you learned that in the homework project, right? CRLF is very important, new lines are not quite the same, it will mess up some things. So headers are separated from the body by an empty line, so you always have a start, and then you keep trying to parse headers, so every time you see a line, you parse it as a header until you see a new line, a line of just CRLF. Then you know you're done with the headers, and you know that everything follows as the body. So, for specifying the method, so this is the method, so um, this kind of does get into REST, although REST is a lot later, but uh, the idea is HTTP is general enough to allow different actions to be taken on a resource, right? So common methods include get, so we just want to get, give me whatever entity is referred to by this URI, right? Give it to me. So one of the important things in here, so did the server make any changes to that resource based on this request? Should this affect the state of the server in any way? No, right? It should be just a get. Just give me that resource. Don't do anything else. Don't change the state of your server. Just give me that resource. Whereas post basically says, hey, I'm going to send you some data in my body, and you're going to figure out what to do with that in relation to this specific resource that I'm talking about. Right? So this specifically says, hey, make some changes or do something. Right, what that something is is application dependent, but it means the post means do something. Put is actually a historical thing that's been used to say, hey, replace that resource with this content that I'm sending you in the body. And uh, oh, so you can actually, so uh, you can maybe see a little bit of the historical evolution here. Uh, in Tim Berners Lee, original idea, right, it's kind of like a Wikipedia style thing where like people could just, you could change, you wouldn't need to use a web server, you would just have a server and then you could use your browser to edit that page, right? So you could get that page, make changes, and then put that, those changes back and it would be reflected on the server. And actually that was how that first web browser was actually built and ran, was because um, he was, was actually like that. So you could not only, it was not only a browser, but it was also an editor as well. Um, but nowadays, right, we kind of realize, hey, giving everyone in the entire world access to be able to edit our resources is probably not a great idea, right? So that's why there's a whole bunch of access control things that have to happen here to make sure you can actually do this. Um, head is uh, a method that is used, it's identical to a get, except that you're not supposed to return a body. So why would this be useful? Just to see whether you have an updated copy of the resource. Ah, yeah, so that's a good one, right? So um, to see if the copy has been updated, right? Maybe there's additional header information that tells you when it last changed. That's a good one. What else? Some metadata. Some metadata? Why did, uh, why did IP include like ICMP messages like ping and trace route, or not trace route, but ping and those kind of Yeah, so debugging purposes, right? So that so this is kind of where head came about originally, was to just say, okay, just give me that header. So maybe I can check if things exist, if they don't exist, I can do some sanity checking, I can use this as a debugging tool to make sure that those firewalls or proxies along the way are not messing with anything, right? Any of my headers. Um, so yeah, all these reasons. 
Okay, there's also a block floor method, there's an options method, um, which uh, is, I will say, no longer used by most web servers. Um, there's delete, so just like we can get things, post things, put things, we want to be able to delete things from our server. Uh, oh, trace, right. Yes, trace is really interesting. So this is another debugging method which asks the server, send me in the body everything that I sent you. So it's kind of like a ping, but the response you get is everything that you sent. So this allows you also to debug, hey, I want to see what firewall proxies are changing things from the way to me to you, because from the client you can't debug that, right? You can't see what the server sees. So this option allows you to do that. Uh, connect is an option, so if you know you're using a proxy, Connect will actually tell the proxy, hey, I want to connect to this URI. So that way, uh, if your browser is proxy aware, we'll be able to do this. And the dot, dot, dot here is not just because there are more that I didn't want to list, although I'm sure there are. Uh, it's actually that a web server can define arbitrary methods, arbitrary extension methods. So these are defined in the spec. To be an HTTP server, you must support these things but you're free to extend this and do what you want. Okay, so let's look at an example request. So here we have on the first line, this is the status line, right? And then we have a series of headers, and then we have an empty body. So on the status line, we have a get. So you say that, okay, this, the method is get. The resource that it's looking for is slash. The protocol is HTTP 1.1. And then we have each of our headers. So this header, so the order of the headers, do the order matter? Does the order matter? No. So the, or the headers can be in any order. Uh, so we say this uh, came from curl. I'm trying to access uh, google.com. And accept is a header that tells the server, hey, these are the file types that I will support. Right? So that you're actually doing some negotiation between the client and the server. Uh, oh, sorry, not file types. It's the content encoding. So this would be if we support gzip encoding or any kind of other encoding. That's right. So why do we need to specify the host here? Doesn't the server know who we're talking to, right? We clicked on a link for google.com. We resolved google.com to an IP address. We made a request to that IP address on this specific port, and we're telling them we want slash. So why do we need to send a header that tells who we're trying to talk to? Yeah? Uh, a server doesn't want to keep the text. A server, say that again? A server doesn't want to keep the text. So what would that mean from that description I just said? Um, it would be the authority, like they could be two or three authorities. Right, exactly. So the IP address, right? So we could have multiple different authorities or domain names, right, that all have the same server, that IP address that's hosting them. Why would we want that, though? Shouldn't they all be unique? I mean, shared hosting versus virtual. Yeah, but we could give each of those shared or virtual hosts their own IP address, right? Less number of IPs. So like, yeah. <coughs> Not originally. Not originally? What does that mean? When they were first in packet, what was that, 99? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you have to stand up a whole different, whole separate web server or server, actually server with a different home. Right. So it goes back to this problem of how many IP addresses are there in uh, IPv4? Two to, two to the 32, theoretically, right? And then once you start lopping off the local addresses, all that kind of stuff, then you have class. And then you consider the fact that they gave out allocations to various companies and organizations, right? So a lot of companies, uh, not a lot, but some companies have a whole what is it, slash eight IP range, so they have a lot of IP addresses that they're not using. So right now, we, I think we've technically run out of IPv4 addresses, or we're very close to running out, right? So now if you want every single domain name had to have a different IP address, right, that's a problem. But this host header was actually added in HTTP 
or 1.1, 1 .1, sorry. HTTP 1.0 did not have a host header, which was why you had to create different host, different IP addresses for every web server. Like it didn't even make sense. There, you couldn't do virtual hosting because you needed something like this. Or maybe you do something really weird where you put it in the URL itself, but then it's not really virtual host. It's kind of just splitting based on the path. Or something. So this was the, so the web originally didn't have this. The protocols evolved when people realized, hey, it would be a good idea so that we could support all of these things. So now modern requests look much more like this, right? So we actually still have the same features that we're used to. We have the status line, we have the host, we have accepting coding. This says I can accept requests in deflate or gzip. We have an accept uh, header that says, hey, I'll, I'll accept text HTML, application, whatever, whatever, all this stuff. Um, this queue means that this is their preference for what they would like to have. So you can, the preferences are supposed to be in this order, and I believe if there's a tie or something, it will uh, try to take the one that has the higher, I don't know what the Q stands for, QoS maybe? I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, the user agent that specifies the exact, you know, model and version number of Chrome that made this request, right? It's actually kind of crazy if you think about, I mean, we're not, we don't really touch privacy in this class, but if you think about all this information you're sending to every single website that you click on when you're browsing, I don't know, how many websites do you think you visit in like a day? Does it depend on if you're doing a project and looking up a bunch of Stack Overflow questions? <laughs> I know I have constantly like 20, 30 tabs open. I mean, I think sometimes you guys have seen my browser, right? So you're sending all of this information and the IP address that you're coming from to every one of those servers. Kind of crazy. All right, so these are how we do requests. How do we do responses, right? So response, once again, has the protocol version, right, to make sure we're talking the same protocol. It has a status code, right, which we've seen 200, 404, right? There's a whole bunch of different status codes. There's a short reason that describes that status code. And then, similar thing with headers, a new line, and then body. So the syntax, we have the status line, headers, body, each line is separated by CRLF. Uh, headers are separated by a body with an empty line. And it's almost the same overall structure as the request. The big difference is the status line. So let's look. So, okay, so the status code, right? So they're grouped into classes. So there's the 100 classes of responses, which are actually very interesting. So these are just a way to tell the client, hey, I got your request, but I'm still processing it, All right? So this is a response, but it's not exactly a response to, that was crazy, good catch. No, oh, that's weird. I dropped it with one hand, I tried to catch it, but we blew across the room. All right, I'm awake, are you guys awake? <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, so 200, so these are maybe the response code that hopefully we're more used to because this is what we, um, our normal, this is when everything's going good. So the whole 200 class are all successful, that we received the request, we understood the request, and we accepted the requests. 300 level response codes are interesting. They're telling the client, hey, I got your request, but that resource that you wanted is somewhere else. Right, so it's kind of like the original Mario, right? That princess that you're looking for is in another castle. So you have to go somewhere else. So there's a pointer to say, yes, I understood your request, but really you need to go look here for that resource that you wanted. And here could be, again, a URI, so it could be on that machine or a completely different machine. 400 said, means you made a mistake. So I didn't understand your request, right? So that's where 404 comes from. It means you tried to request something that doesn't exist. 500 means I made a mistake, right? The server says, hey, something broke, right? I don't know what happened, but something went wrong, so it wasn't your fault, it's my fault, so probably try again later. Um, so 200 response code, 200's okay. Uh, there's also 201, 202, 204 response code. The 300 response codes are interesting. Um, 301 means move permanently, so the server can, uh, the client can actually store 
Whenever it tries to get this resource, it can always go somewhere else. So it, this tells the client it can store that in its cache. Um, 307 is a temporary redirect, which means, hey, go get the resource over here, but next time you want this thing, contact me. Uh, some other ones, 400 for a bad request. 401 if you're unauthorized, so maybe you've seen this if you tried to access a page that weren't logged in. 403 means you're forbidden. Uh, 404 is not found. Uh, 500 means that there's an internal server error. This is kind of the general when we've seen the problem. And uh, 501 to 52, 503, these are all different types of errors. Okay, well, let's look at a request. So, uh, so now we have our example here of this get slash HTML 1.1. Uh, user created curl, so this is what we just saw. So now let's look at the response. So the response that Google sends us is actually this huge response, right? But if we break it down at the top, we have the status line. And the very first thing on that status line tells us the protocol. So this says, this is an HTTP 1.1 response. The response code is 200. This means everything was good. And that short little status code from Google, from Google tells us that everything is OK, which calms us and makes us happy. OK. So some other things. Um, so. This header, the expires header, I believe, and this cache control header, I don't actually know. What does expires of negative one mean? Does that mean it never expires or always expires? It's one of the two. Cache control private max age zero. So what would this do to cache? Does this mean that it so how would you find this out if you wanted to understand more about this header? The RFC, yeah, I'm never switching from man pages to RFCs. It's close. I don't think the man page will tell you much. The RFC will definitely tell you what this means. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know 100% exact, but it's basically telling the caches along the way, as we saw, right, the proxy, the browser cache, who can cache it, and how long they can cache things for if they can. Um, we have the content type, so this tells our browser how to interpret the response, right? HTTP hypertext transport protocol, so this says, hey, what I'm sending you is text HTTP, HTML, sorry. Yeah, text HTML. And it even tells us the character set encoding of our response, right? So that our browser can properly interpret that. Um, and so this, is, so this is the body, so there's a bunch of other things in here. There's some cross-site scripting prevention stuff, some frame Quick jacking stuff. Uh, and then finally, the body with the HTML of the page. So, another thing, interesting thing that we're going to look at really quickly is that HTTP has an authentication mechanism built in. So, it's based off of this challenge response scheme. So, the basic idea is if you request some resource, the server responds with a 401 that says, hey, you're unauth un unauthorized, and it tells you as part of the header the schema that it wants you to use. Um, and the idea is you need to be able to, so this is when the server then pops up that window that says, hey, fill in your username and password. And then when you fill it in, it sets this authorization header. Um, so, when you get the reply, there's going to be a header in a 401 message that says www-authenticate, basic authentication for this realm of reserved docs. Then the client retries the access, including in the header a field containing a cookie composed of Base64 encoded username and password. So how secure is Base64 encoding? What is Base64 encoding? It's a representation of binary in the form of characters. Right, so it represents it in the form, I actually can't remember the entire character set, but yes, it represents it in characters. Is it a cryptographic encryption or hash or anything? No, you can take this string and you can go back and figure out exactly what that password is, right? So you can, crack this username and password exactly from this. And if we're using HTTP, 
right? What do we know about the data sent over a TCP connection? Clear text, right? Yeah. HTTP isn't doing it. I mean, TCP isn't performing any encryption or anything, right? And HTTP, we to talk about it, but it's just using regular TCP. It's not encrypting anything. So anybody on that path, right, can anybody on your router or on your open wireless network can see that packet that you send with this data in here and can immediately crack and just, it's not crack, it's decode your username and password from there. Um, so it's kind of funny that HTTP authentic authentication is quote, quote, built into HTTP, but A, it's terrible, and B, it provides a really bad user experience because you have that pop-up. Um, so HTTP 1.1 has a little bit better authentication scheme. Uh, so you can actually use this some cryptography where we get a nonce. Uh, we basically hash the username, password, the nonce value, the HTTP method, and the requested URL. Uh, but the problem here is the server has to have access to your plain text username and passwords, right? Which is not always great. Um, so, okay, I want to finish up here. So you can actually use most of the, all the techniques and tools that we talked about in internet insecurity to talk to analyze and look at your HTTP traffic. You can use TCP dump to look at the traffic that's going on on your system. You can use Wireshark to do the same thing. Um, we can use sniffers to collect traffic, right? So we can use sniffers on a network to collect, collect all the port 80 there. Um, we can configure servers to create logs. Um, I honestly, when I'm doing web security stuff, nine times, eight times out of 10, I just use a straight browser. Like I don't, a lot of browsers, especially now with all of the developer tools that are built into them, have a lot of the information that you need. So really most of what you need is a browser. Um, proxies are really great to be able to analyze the traffic without having to modify anything. So this is another uh, technique that I use. So client-side proxies are also really effective means of intercepting and understanding what's going on. Um, so Firefox has extensions like live HTTP headers, tamper data. If you just open Chrome or Firefox and you open the developer tools and make a request, you can see all the headers that were sent and all the headers that were received. Uh, the one tool I'll mention, Burp Proxy, it's a professional grade tool, so it's um, it's a commercial tool, I think it costs about $300 for a license, but it has a free version that has just some modules disabled, but even the free version is super easy, awesome, really cool to use. Uh, you set up the Burp, Burp proxy, you set up your browser to use Burp proxy, and then it will pause and let you inspect every request your browser makes and every response that comes back. It keeps track of all the requests and responses, and then you can say, okay, I want to make this request again, but manually change one of these values. And so you can easily see exactly what's going on there. So if you're interested in web security stuff, I highly recommend checking out Burp Proxy. Cool. And then we'll stop here. When we come back, we'll talk about HTML.